Hi everyone. Part two covers paired samples t-tests. To complete part two, you need SPSS, you need your pink book, and this is all in chapter six. You need the data files data underscore six underscore one and data underscore six underscore two. So if you're ready to enter data manually or to open data underscore six underscore one in SPSS, let's get started. So paired samples t-tests go by many names. What is called a paired sample t-test in SPSS can also be referred to as a related samples t-test, a dependent samples t-test, or a repeated measure. And paired samples t-tests differ from independent samples uh, because whereas in independent samples you're testing uh, the, for a difference between two group means, here you're testing whether the means of two related or dependent samples are different. And just as a reminder, you have related samples. Uh, very often when the same subjects or participants generated data for both samples, so if you have, for example, an easy condition and a difficult condition, you have the same however many participants generate data, participate in the easy condition, and then they also participated in the difficult condition. You can also have paired samples tests if you, you have subjects or participants who form dyads. So for example, if you're getting estimates of a child's behavior from a mother and a father or from a caregiver and a teacher or something like that, the key question for whether a sample is independent or dependent is could you calculate a meaningful difference score? Now with an independent samples t-test, the data in your two samples aren't in any particular order, right? So calculating the difference between participant one's score from group one and participant two's score from group two is not meaningful. But if you do the same thing in a paired sample t-test, it is meaningful because participant one in condition one and participant one in condition two should be, are probably the same participant. Right. So you can calculate a meaningful difference score. Now again, just like independent samples t-test, paired samples t-tests are based on sample means. They're the parametric equivalent of the Wilcox and signed rank test that we went over in topic four and chapter six of field. And paired samples t-tests are just like calculating a z-score, except we're adjusting the distribution to be more conservative because we don't really know uh, sigma. We don't know the population standard deviation. Single sample t-tests and paired samples t-tests are mathematically equivalent. All right, here's our first example. A local cycling association encourages its members to wear fluorescent vests when riding after dark. They argue that doing so makes cyclists more visible to passing motorists, uh, which should make them safer. They want to provide some empirical evidence of this, so the association's chairperson hires a driving simulator that has been specially programmed to show a virtual cyclist a, in an evening driving simulation at random intervals. When the cyclist appears, the driver who's participating must respond as quickly as possible by pressing a button located on the simulator steering wheel. So this is like saying, oh, I recognize that the cyclist is there and I have to be aware of their presence and not uh, crash into them, not drive them off the road, whatever. Now in a complete testing session, the driver will be exposed to 10 cyclists, five wearing fluorescent vests and five in non-fluorescent attire. And the pink book categorizes the fluorescent vests as the experimental trials and the non-fluorescent attire as the control trials. I'm only mentioning that because that's how they've organized their data in SPSS. Uh, you don't have to think about the fluorescent vest as being an experimental, as being the experimental group. You could flip them around uh, so that's a little bit arbitrary, but that's what they've done. Anyway, these trials are presented in random order. Now that's important because you wouldn't want to test everyone with five trials of the non-fluorescent attire followed by five trials of the fluorescent attire 
or vice versa, because if you got a difference in reaction time, it could be a practice effect, right? It could just be that the drivers get better at reacting because they become more accustomed to the simulator. Anyway, after all 10 trials, the driver's average reaction times for both the fluorescent and non-fluorescent vest conditions can be calculated. And it's those averages for a group of 15 participants that are reported in Table 6.1. And the chairperson thinks that reaction times would be faster when the cyclists were wearing fluorescent vests. So here we have table 6.1. All right, so let's go over this. Let's uh, think about what's the independent variable, the dependent variable, what's the re research question, what's the null hypothesis, and what is an alternative hypothesis. Okay, so the independent variable is the cyclist attire, whether it was fluorescent or not. And the dependent variable is the reaction time in milliseconds in the driving simulator. So this is a nice applied research uh, problem. And one way we might word the research question is, do drivers react differently depending on what cyclists wear? And the null hypothesis then would be that reaction times were not affected by virtual cyclists attire. All right. And you'll note that the pink book says that chairperson thinks that reaction times will be faster during the experimental trials, that is, when the cyclists are wearing fluorescent vests. So that's a clear one-tailed hypothesis. Right? However, you'd probably be interested in statistically significant results in either direction. That is, unless your real goal is to sell neon clothes rather than to make cyclists safer, you would want to know if drivers reacted faster when the virtual cyclist did not wear fluorescent clothes. So I think it makes more sense to conduct this as a two-tailed hypothesis. So our alternative two-tailed hypothesis would just be that reaction time was different when the virtual cyclist wore fluorescent clothes versus non-fluorescent clothes. Now I've got the data sets for chapter six. We're going with the first example, so I'm going to open up data underscore six underscore one dot SAV in SPSS. And here's the data file. Now, if you want to enter these data from table 6.1 on page 62 into SPSS by hand yourself, you want to have two variables. So if we go into variable view, you need a control variable. You don't have to call it control, but um, Alan Bennett and Heritage have called it control that reports the average reaction time data collected during the control that is the non-fluorescent trial. So that's that second column in table 6.1. And notice they've added a label, but no value labels. And that's because this is a scale measure Right? Milliseconds, reaction time in milliseconds is a scale variable, so we don't need to specify what those numbers mean. You also need a second variable, the what the pink book has called EXP or for experimental, the average of the reaction time data collected during the fluorescent vest trials. Now, just like we've done in previous examples, you might want to set up an ID or participant number identification just to help you keep track of your participants. Now, right, before we can do anything with the data file that we've now got set up, we need to check the assumptions of paired samples t-tests. And just like last time, there's not consensus among psychologists about when or whether ordinal scale measures can be assessed with parametric tests. Uh, but interval and ratio scale variables certainly can, and this is reaction time in milliseconds, which is a ratio scale variable, so we're okay on that front. The assumption of independence of observations is a design issue. You'd want to make sure that each participant participated in each condition exactly once. And for normality, we're going to look at QQ plots again in addition to histograms. In this case, we have sort of two different versions of normality. So the group of scores, each group of scores, that is the reaction times 
when the virtual cyclist was wearing the fluorescent vest versus the reaction times when the virtual cyclist was not wearing the fluorescent vest should both be uh, drawn from normal distributions. But the critical assumption here is that the different scores, the differences between pairs of scores should be normally distributed because that's actually what we're doing. Based, that's the underlying math of what we're doing the statistical test on. Now there's no assumption here for homogeneity of variance. In this case, homogeneity of variance does not apply because effectively we only have one sample, right? That's the sample of different scores. All right, so the main thing we want to assess is whether our different scores are normally distributed. But you'll notice that we don't have different scores in our SPSS data set. So the first thing we need to do is calculate a different score. And the way I'm going to do that is compute a new variable. So click on transform and then compute variable. Now our target variable, remember that's the name of the variable, so that has to have, that has to obey all of the rules of variable names. So it can't start with a number, it can't include any illegal characters, and it can't have any spaces. If you want to provide a little bit more detail, you can click on the type and label button and then give it a label that's the same as the label in variable view. So you can use spaces, you can use funny characters, things like that if you want, or you can use the mathematical expression that you're about to use to calculate this new variable as your label. So that's what I'm going to do. And this is a numeric rather than a numeric variable rather than a string variable. String just means a string of characters rather than a number. So we've got our target variable name, different score. We've told SPSS a little bit about it when we clicked on type and label. And the numeric expression we're going to use is to get the different score is the control reaction time minus the experimental reaction time. So I'm going to move control over. And then you can either type it on your keyboard or click the button for minus to subtract and then experimental. So control minus experimental. Uh, it doesn't matter which order you put these in. You can calculate the different score as control minus experimental or experimental minus control. Uh, in terms of assessing normality, you get the same thing. In terms of statistical tests, you'd get the opposite sign, but the same um, outcome. So in terms of whether it's statistically significant or not. Let's just click OK. And now we've added a new variable to our data set. Notice that it's by default got two decimal places and it's coded as a nominal variable. You don't have to change any of that, but if you want things to look nice, note the SPSS generated a label for us automatically. So it says we computed the difference equals control minus experimental. This is a scale variable. It can't hurt to change that while we're here, but so if we want to look at histograms and QQ plots, we're going to do that in the same way that we have before. We're going to explore our data. So click analyze and then descriptive statistics and then explore. The variable that I'm most critically interested in is the difference score, but I'm going to look at all three on my dependent list. So we have no factor. We're not going to factor anything. We're not labeling cases by anything. You can change the descriptive statistics that you report if you like, but you don't have to. And then for plots, I recommend that you look at the histogram and also at the normality plots. And then we click continue. We want to display both statistics and plots, and then we click OK. And here's our output. So we have a case processing summary, as usual, that just reminds us we don't have any missing uh, data points. So
we've got some descriptive statistics. So note again, uh, as we've seen before, the upper bound for the experimental 95% confidence interval is below the lower bound for the control 95% confidence interval. So those confidence intervals we can tell just from the descriptive statistics do not overlap. Here are our tests of normality. This is not going to happen terribly often, but we see no evidence of violations of normality in the KS or Shapiro-Wilkes tests, which means we can be pretty confident that our data were drawn from normal distributions. And just to confirm that visually, we can look at the histogram for the non-fluorescent cyclist condition and the QQ plot. And so this is just to give you an, an idea. Here are examples of what normally distributed, roughly normally distributed histograms and QQ plots and detrended QQ plots look like. And then the experimental. There's maybe a tiny bit of skew, but not enough that we would ever worry about it. So you, that skew plays out with a little bit more variability in the higher scores than the lower scores relative to the expected value. Now here with the difference score, this looks a little less normally distributed, but again, remember this is sufficiently normally distributed. This is a normal enough distribution that we're not concerned about violations of normality. And again, those data points don't lie exactly on the line, but they're pretty close to it. And we've got about equal numbers of data points above the zero line as below the zero line in the detrended plot. And we've got what looks to be a fairly symmetrical uh, box plot. Okay, so in terms of the assumption of normality, in particular, the uh, whether the different scores are normally distributed, we can be confident that they are normally distributed, which means that we can proceed with our t-test. Okay, now, the t-test is actually not going to use the different score at all. The only reason we did that was so that we could assess normality of the different scores. So we're going to select Analyze, Compare Means. Now we're doing a paired samples t-test. So the second from the last option there, and click on paired samples t-test. And it opens a dialog box where it asks you for variable one and variable two. The reason for that is that SPSS is going to calculate the different score. If we hadn't done it, SPSS would calculate the different score for us. And so all of that happens in the background of SPSS. We don't see the actual math that goes in. What you can do is click on your first variable and move it over and then click on your second variable, which in our case is going to be experimental, so the fluorescent vest, move it over. You can do that a couple of different ways. If you select them both at the same time, it will move them into variable one and variable two. Um, like I said before, it doesn't matter whether the non-fluorescent condition is in variable one and the fluorescent in variable two or vice versa. The only thing that changes is the sign of the statistical test. So in one case you'd get positive 2.75, then in the other case you'd get negative 2.75. Okay. As far as options go, those default options are uh, going to fit in most cases. So we'll click continue. Now I just want to note we haven't specified anywhere whether we want a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. The default is two-tailed and we are doing a two-tailed test so we're fine. So let's click OK. Okay so with the dependent samples t-test we get three tables in our SPSS output. The first one just shows us some descriptive statistics. So the mean, the sample size, the standard deviation and standard error of the mean for reaction times from each condition. The second table 
shows us the correlation. So it calculates a correlation between reaction times in the non-fluorescent condition and reaction times in the fluorescent condition. And then the third table has our test statistics. Okay, so from the first table, we can see that the mean reaction time was higher or slower when the virtual cyclist was not wearing neon. And that second table shows us the correlation between fluorescent and non-fluorescent uh, reaction times. The positive correlation there, that 0.499, just tells us that uh, the people who were relatively quick, who reacted relatively quickly in one condition, also reacted relatively quickly in the other condition, too. And then in the third table, uh, we've only got one row for the paired samples t-test, since there's only one set of different scores and no possibility of heterogeneous variances. So this tells us something about descriptive statistics for the different scores and uh, actually gives us a 95% confidence interval as well. And then gives us details about the test statistic. Uh, now, a couple things I want you to note. In this case, we've got a t-score of 8.391, which is pretty high for a t-score. We have 14 degrees of freedom. Now, recall that we had 15 participants, so 15 pairs of observations which means that we have uh, 14 degrees of freedom. In a paired sample t-test, we only lose one degree of freedom because we're only calculating one different score. And then that significance level, 0 0.000, that's our p-value, and that tells us that the difference is statistically significant. So we can conclude that Reaction time in the non-fluorescent condition was significantly slower than reaction time in the fluorescent condition. We're also going to want to compute a, an effect size. Just like in previous examples, I think the non-standardized effect size is often the most meaningful. So we can say reaction times were 101.8 milliseconds faster when the virtual cyclist wore fluorescent colors because we calculated control minus experimental. So this positive number means participants were faster to react when the cyclist was wearing a neon vest, which is consistent with the directional hypothesis of the cyclist association um, chairperson. And Note that you'd probably also want to report that 95% confidence interval when you report the non-standardized effect size. Now the next question is how big, how many standard deviations away from zero is the mean difference score? And I want to point out that the formula on page 69 is not correct. The denominator of the equation is not the pooled variance from the two different groups because we don't have two different groups. All we need to do is use the standard deviation of the different score. So it's actually a lot more straightforward. Okay, so another way of writing M1 minus M2 is just M difference. So the difference between the mean for the control condition and the mean for the experimental condition is the same as the mean difference score, which we've got reported up here. This is just sort of the first half of that third SPSS output table. So we want the mean for that difference score in the numerator and the standard deviation for that difference score in the denominator. We happen to have both of those in this table. So you can calculate for that for yourself. What you end up with is 101.8 divided by something that is very, very slightly less than 47. You get something close to 2.16. All right, so we would conclude that a difference of 101.8 milliseconds is equivalent to 2.16 standard deviations.
Last thing I'd like you to do is write up these results in APA style. When you're ready, meet me on the next uh, screen and we'll go over my write-up. All right, hello again. So I've written that the mean reaction times of 15 drivers to a virtual cyclist wearing either non-fluorescent or fluorescent clothing in an evening driving simulation were compared. Now, if I were writing this up for publication, uh, I would probably say we compared mean reaction times. Avoid the uh, slightly awkward passive voice. However, if you're thinking about writing this up as a lab report, if you were writing it up by yourself, you wouldn't use the royal we, we compared, because there aren't multiple of you. It would just be you. Um, and for whatever reason, people don't like seeing the word I in APA style lab reports. They're worried that you're going to try and turn it into an autobiography, I think. Now, I think. The judicious use of first-person pronouns, I and we, in results sections can be very effective and it can make results sections easier to read. However, that's in many cases not the standard, so many people don't, uh, don't like that and so they result to resort to the passive voice. So that's where that were compared comes from. That's not a big deal either way, but there it is. So said a little bit about what the results are. And then this statement, visual inspection of quantile quantile plots for both times, for both conditions of different scores indicate no violations of normality, which is just my sort of lip service to the fact that we assessed that assumption. I'm going to want to know for a lab report and other instructors are probably going to want to know for your lab reports that you can confirm that you did assess assumptions, whether they're violated or not. But again, you probably wouldn't include that in a journal article. So we've got descriptive statistics. I reported mean reaction time when the virtual cyclist wore non-fluorescent clothing was for 22.6 milliseconds and with the standard deviation in parentheses. And just note that I've reported milliseconds as MS rather than MSEC, which I think is how the pink book reported it. If you go back to page 109, I think it is, yes, of your APA 6th, there's a table, table 4.4, with common abbreviations for units of measurement, and underneath the table, they have abbreviations for units of time, and millisecond is MS, not MSEC. That's a little bit more concise. So that's what you are to do if you're reporting reaction times in milliseconds. The abbreviation is MS. Anyway, so I've got a sentence about mean reaction times when the virtual cyclist wore non-fluorescent clothing and when the virtual cyclist wore fluorescent clothing and then the clause in that sentence. So I've put a comma on average 108 milliseconds faster with a 95% confidence interval. So like I said, this statement about visual inspection is something that I want to see in your lab reports that other people are probably going to want to see for as long as you're a student in lab reports, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily put in a journal article. So if you don't see that kind of statement in a publication as you're reading primary source material as part of your uh, studies in psychology, it doesn't mean that the person, that the authors didn't check that, uh, the convention is not to report it unless there's a violation. All right, so after the statement about how much faster reaction times were in the fluorescent condition than the non-fluorescent condition, I've written a two-tailed paired samples t-test with an alpha of 0.05 uh, revealed that reaction times were significantly faster when the virtual cyclist wore fluorescent clothes. So I've written two tails. I've told you how many tails the paired samples t-test has. 
I've also reported the alpha level. Now I know I haven't done this before. Generally in publications you will see something about what the alpha level is. So that's uh, my type 1 error rate that I'm prepared to tolerate. Uh, and an alpha level of 0.05 means that I'll reject the null hypothesis if my p-value, my significance level, is less than 0.05. In most cases, most people use a, an alpha of 0.05 throughout their document. So if you're reporting lots of results, what you might do is stick a statement at the end of the method section or the beginning of the results section saying something like an alpha of 0.05 was used for all statistical tests. And then you wouldn't write it over and over and over again. But I thought it was nice that the authors of the pink book included that as just a little reminder that you probably would want to say that somewhere in the document. And it revealed that reaction times were significantly faster when the virtual cyclist wore fluorescent clothes. And then there's my T-score. So a T with 14 degrees of freedom with a T-score of 8.39. And our P-value, again, was less than 0.001. We know it's not zero, but we don't know how much less, and APA style doesn't care when it's that small. And we've got both the non-standardized effect size and the standardized effect size. All right, so now's a good time to save your output file with the memorable names that you come back to it. That you probably did modify your data file so you could save that data file as well to, so that it includes those different scores. Okay, we've got one more example to go. We'll go through this one a little bit faster than we went through the first paired sample t-test example. So a psychologist wishes to assess the efficacy of a new cognitive behavioral treatment for generalized anxiety. Before beginning the treatment with a new client, she asks the client to complete the Beck Anxiety Inventory. The pre-treatment Beck Anxiety Inventory scores for 12 clients are listed in the first column of Table 6.2. Scores on this measure can range from 0 all the way up to 63, and higher scores indicate more anxiety. So we see lots of 40s and 50s in that case. So people's pre-treatment anxiety scores tended to be high. Now at the end of the eight week treatment program, the psychologist asked each client to again complete the Beck anxiety inventory. The post-treatment scores for the 10 clients who completed the full eight week program are listed in the second column of table 6.2. Post-treatment data are not available for two clients who dropped out of the program after two and five weeks respectively. And that's not unusual in pre-post experimental designs, right? that you get some attrition, not everyone finishes the entire program. So just as a reminder, this is table 6.2 from page 71 of the pink book. Now what's the research question, the null hypothesis, and alternative hypothesis? And also, what are the independent and dependent variables? Okay, our independent variable is uh, pre versus post treatment. Now you'll notice that that's not strictly speaking uh, experimentally uh, randomly assigned, right? You can't randomly assign participants to experience the post treatment effects before they have the pre treatment effects. Uh, so if you really wanted to be able to say that the treatment caused the change in anxiety, how you make that causal attribution, you would need to do some uh, additional work. But we've got pretreatment versus post-treatment as our independent variable, and anxiety is our dependent variable that's operationalized as the Beck Anxiety Inventory Score. Now, this is classified in the data file as a scale variable, but this is one of those scores that's actually an ordinal scale variable that uh, people treat as an interval scale variable. This treatment of the Beck anxiety inventory as a scale variable is well validated and quite common in psychology.
right? Here's my research question very simply. Is this new cognitive behavioral treatment for anxiety effective? The null hypothesis would be basically that it's not. If it's not effective, then pre-treatment and post-treatment anxiety scores should be the same. My alternative hypothesis is non-directional. Pre-treatment and post-treatment anxiety levels are not the same. So this is a two-tailed hypothesis. All right, we check assumptions in the same way as before. Um, let's do that now. So we've got a small data set. And we've got some missing data here, which, like I said, is not uncommon. So, so before we analyze anything, we're going to compute a different score. And I'm going to click on Type and Label and use the expression as the label. This is going to be a numeric variable because both of the other variables we are using are numeric. So let's click Continue. So choose pre-treatment minus post-treatment. Notice I'm not doing anything to select cases. I'm not doing anything to deal with my missing data. I'm just going to click OK. And now we have a different score. And for those two instances where we have a pre-treatment score but no post-treatment score, we also have no different score. So we didn't need to do anything to deal with the absence of any data. The next thing we want to do is assess the normality of our different scores. So analyze descriptive statistics, explore. And we can look at all three of them. But what's critically important is that that different score is part of the dependent list. We'll look at the histogram. We're actually not going to look at the stem and leaf plots, although we can. I'm going to look at normality plots, say continue, and click OK. And note the mean pretreatment anxiety score was 44.3, and the mean post-treatment score was 41.8. If you look at those confidence intervals, unlike the last time, we have a fair bit of overlap, actually quite a lot of overlap. Our mean Different score is 2.5, which means there was a mean change of 2.5 points on the Beck Anxiety in Inventory. And our 95% confidence interval does just barely include zero. All right, yet again, no significant violations of normality, which is good because it tells us that these data are normally distributed. So all of these data are normally distributed. Here's a normal histogram. For pretreatment scores, a normal QQ plot, a normal detrended QQ plot, a normal box plot, and so on and so forth. So these are all normal distributions, or at least sufficiently normal that we can go ahead and conduct a parametric t-test. So let's do that just like last time, analyze, compare means, Paired samples t-test. So pre-treatment score is going to be variable 1, post-treatment score variable 2. Nothing fancy with the options. Right. Nothing fancy, just click OK. And we get the same three tables as before. So what we can see from these tables is that Anxiety did decrease post-treatment. We went from 44.3 down to 41.8. So that is a decrease in anxiety score. It's not enormous, but it did go down. And again, we've got a positive end. Uh, unlike last time, we've got a statistically significant correlation between pre-treatment scores and post-treatment scores. So what that tells us is that People who started with higher anxiety scores uh, ended up with higher, relatively higher anxiety scores in the post-treatment uh, assessment. Notice we've got a sample size of 10 in both cases. And here are our descriptive statistics and our 95% confidence interval on our different score. And our T-score 
with 9 degrees of freedom and the p-value. Uh, now, if we're using an alpha of 0.05, we've obtained a p-value of 0.054, which is greater than 0.05, so we would have to conclude that the difference is not statistically significant. Let's calculate the effect size. And again, recall that the formula that the pink book is using is not the uh, not the appropriate formula. So we've got a non-standardized effect size of 2.5 points, but that 95% confidence interval does include zero, kind of just barely. And Cohen's D is just the mean difference score divided by the standard deviation of the difference, which we can obtain from that third table in the SPSS output. So we have a mean difference score of 2.5 divided by a standard deviation of difference scores, 3.6 which gets us an effect size of 0.68. This effect size, this is about two-thirds of a standard deviation, which is uh, possibly clinically significant, right? If people are experiencing anxiety to the point that they are having trouble making it through their daily lives, then decreasing their anxiety by that amount, even if it's small, might be enough that it's worth going through those eight weeks of treatment. So why didn't we get a statistically significant result even though the result might in fact be clinically significant? And the answer might have something to do with our very small sample size. So think back to topic two when we talked about statistical power. So statistical power is the power of a test to detect an effect of a given size. You might have some a priori idea about how big of an effect is a significant effect, a clinically significant effect or a meaningful effect. And the thinking is, the idea is that what you would do is think about what is the smallest effect that I would consider a meaningful effect. And then you want to make sure you have a certain uh, amount of power to detect that effect. So you would do a power analysis when you're figuring out in your experimental design how many participants do I need to, um, to in order to make reliable conclusions about my data. We're not in a position where we can do that because um, we were given the data that we had so all we could do is look at uh, the 10 participants whose different scores we had. But what we can do is ask how much statistical power does this test have to detect an effect uh, that we've determined is clinically significant. Now, we've got an effect size of 0.68, but we might determine that even a half standard deviation, 0.5, of a standard deviation would be a clinically significant effect. So let's say we're a clinical psychologist and we know that we would be interested in doing more study in further pursuing this as a treatment option for our clients if we got an effect size of a half a standard deviation. So let's figure out how much statistical power we had we would have had to detect that effect. So this is a different statistics calculator. If you type in danielsoper.com uh, and then go to power analysis, this is the post hoc statistical power for a student's t-test. We might want to know, remember we decided that we would be interested in pursuing further treatment if we could decrease anxiety scores by half of a standard deviation. The probability level is our alpha, so we're going to stick with 0.05. We did not have a sample size of 30, we only had a sample size of 10. And as you can see, that gives us about 10% power for our two-tailed hypothesis, or 18% power for our one-tailed hypothesis, which is really low power. So one possible conclusion here, we might conclude that these results were not statistically significant because the treatment's not effective, but it's also plausible that these results were not statistically significant because they were underpowered.
Okay, if you haven't done so, now's a, a good time to save this output file. Uh, this is the fourth example we've covered for tutorial number five. Remember, you've also modified your data file, so you might want to save that as well. I'm not gonna, going to go over an APA style write-up of this example because we've already done three of those for t-tests, but I would encourage you to look at page 74 of the pink book to see how they've written up this uh, not statistically significant uh, test. All right, and the last thing before we go is I want to talk about pre preparing your analyses for your practical report. But what you are probably going to want to do as at least part of your practical report is compare the number of phase two bets placed by participants in the experimental group who experienced those near wins versus the number placed by the control group who did not experience the near wins. So that should tell you that you've got two groups, which means that a t-test might be an appropriate way to analyze your data. Now, you might have a one-tailed directional hypothesis about how these data would come out, but what I recommend that you do is a two-tailed test with the thinking that you would be interested in the difference, in a statistically significant difference, regardless which direction it was in. And I also want to remind you that when you check assumptions, uh, no matter which data set you have, both of those final samples, I, I believe, have more than 30 observations. So if I recall correctly, your sample size for each group is greater than 30. And recall that when we have more than 30 observations in a sample, the central limit theorem tells us we don't need to worry too much about whether the data are normally distributed. So what that means is if you have decided that you're going to do a t-test, and I will leave it to you to determine whether this is an independent samples t-test or a paired samples t-test, and you are checking your assumptions, the assumption of normality is less important because the result is going to be the same no matter what. So what does that mean that you do? One thing you could do is report in your results section that you have more than 30 observations in each group. So you did not assess normality because the central limit theorem dictates that violations, that t-tests are robust to violations of normality when the sample size is greater than 30. Or you could check that assumption. You could look at the QQ plots and the histograms and then say uh, visual inspection of QQ plots revealed that either this sample is normally distributed or the sample is not normally distributed or whatever the case happens to be. And then you could say, but because sample sizes were greater than 30, t-tests are uh, robust to violations of normality, so uh, whatever type of t-test was conducted. Or you could report that you checked the assumptions, report any violations if you find them, and then do and then report how you dealt with them, right? So if you're going to transform your data, then how you transformed your data. If you are going to use a non-parametric test, then which non-parametric test you used, right? So all three of those are options. Either say something about you didn't check whether data were normally distributed because your sample size was large enough that you didn't have to. Check and then report that because your sample size was large enough, you don't have to do anything about it or you didn't do anything about it. Or check, report it, and do something about it. No matter what you do, you need to report what you do. All right. I hope that after all that, you're feeling enthused and empowered to analyze your practical report data set. If you're attending the intensive school up in Armadale, I'll see you up here in a couple of weeks. Otherwise, I hope you have a productive couple of weeks getting caught up on reading, report writing, and other work, and I will see you after the break. Bye for now.